we all grow up with the idea that there is some sort of effective protection of animals and that we have something called animal protection law. It's, it's just totally not true. <laughs> um, and it's important to figure out why it's not true. In this first episode, we speak about animal rights with Will Kimlicker, a decorated philosopher and Canada Research Chair in the Political Philosophy Department at Queen's University, where he has taught since 1998. Will has published over eight books and 200 articles, and most pertinent for today's episode is his book Zoopolis, The Political Theory of Animal Rights, which he co-authored with his partner, Sue Donaldson. each other now for it's almost a year actually which is kind of great as you know the first season uh, of the animal turn we're going to be looking at law um now i'm not a lawyer and a very little about law actually except that it protects me but you know a fair deal about law in particular about rights but you're not a lawyer either are you no uh, so i'm a political philosopher and political philosophy is largely about the state and how the state governs us, and the state primarily governs through law. So there's a pretty intimate connection between political philosophy and law. Mm -hmm. um, and much of what I do is about what kinds of laws um, are, are desirable and legitimate uh, for governing humans or animals. So law is not just um, people standing in courtrooms and shouting objection. It's, it's more involved than, than just what we see in popular media. Well, so law means legislation. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so I think, I guess you are thinking about litigation. So that there are legal disputes and citizens every once in a while sue each other in court and then you have legal cases that involve litigation okay. but uh, and so that you you do need to be a, a professional lawyer uh, let's say to be <laughs> to be <laughs> an expert on litigation okay but most but law but law it concerns anything that is the subject of legislation so uh, the the state legislates, well, everything. So it, it, it legislates what kinds of identifications we need to have. It legislates what kind of credentials you need to be engaged in what kinds of activities. It legislates uh, permissible ways in which you and I can interact, permissible ways to engage in economic transactions, what kinds of marriages are valid or invalid, what kinds of property title is valid. I mean, every, everything, every feature of social life takes place against a background of legislation which lays out what are the permissible ways for individuals to interact. So where would philosophy then fit in this realm of thinking about legislation? What would you as a political philosopher play in terms of conversations about law? So there are really um, at least two different routes uh, from, from political philosophy to law. So one is, I mean, in a way, the original question, perhaps, in political philosophy in the West for 2,000 years is why is there... Well, why does the state have the right to govern us in the first place? So how is it possible that somebody or something can tell me what I'm allowed to use, what I'm allowed to own. Um, so, and, and more specifically, we might say, how do we distinguish legitimate governing through law 
from simply the brute exercise of power. So uh, St. Augustine asked, um, what's the difference between a state and a band of robbers? So you, you encounter a band of robbers on the road, and they hold you up at gunpoint and demand money. So we, think, we typically think that's totally illegitimate. But on the other hand, you have a state which puts up a toll booth um, and says, demands you hand over money if you're going to proceed over a bridge. So how do we distinguish this, a legitimate state from a band of robbers? And that's, So that's the question about the legitimacy of the state. Uh, what are the circumstances under which some, this institution comes legitimately to govern us? So you as a philosopher would be considering those forms of legitimacy? Thinking yeah. Thinking about what makes that power dynamic work? Exactly. And, or what makes it legit work sounds a bit uh, kind of utilitarian. So sometimes legitimate governments aren't very effective, mm -hmm. and, and you can have very effective forms of states that are illegitimate. Okay. Right? So, so, the, the, so the question is, when, is, when is it legitimate for a state to claim the right to govern us, to claim the legitimate authority to set the rules for how we interact. And the, the usual answer to that question in the Western tradition is that a legitimate state can, can legitimately govern us if it governs in our interests. So it's, so this is what distinguishes the state from the band of robbers. The band of robbers is, is taking our money for its own purposes. Mm -hmm. A legitimate state is doing this for the good of the governed. And so... So then the question is, how can you structure a state so that the laws that it passes are in fact in the interest of those who are subject to the laws? How do you make the law responsive to the interests of the governed? And for 200 years or so, we typically assume that that requires democracy, that democracy is the mechanism. So Augustine didn't think it required democracy, but today we think that a legitimate state most people think that a state, in order to be legitimate, in, it ha its laws must be responsive to the interests of the governed, and that's only going to happen if the if the state, if the government is in fact accountable mm -hmm. to the people through some kind of democracy. So one of the things that I'm interested in uh, is how do we how do we think about that in the context of animals? Mm -hmm. So I think we can ask the same question that Augustine asked. How do we distinguish the legitimate governing of animals from just exploitation or oppression uh, for tyranny? Right. So that's that's actually the kind of in the in the class in the in the traditional political philosophy. This is the we distinguish legitimate governance from tyranny. That's that's a, like for two thousand years. That's been kind of one of the foundational questions of political philosophy. How do you distinguish a legitimate state from tyranny? So and the that's broken up into a whole bunch of smaller components yeah, to yeah. try and see. Okay. It, and so, so my view is looking around, I think the way in which we govern animals is just tyranny. Like, mm -hmm. So we have these mechanisms in place to ensure that the governing of humans is not tyranny. They don't, sometimes those mechanisms work, sometimes they don't, but at least we have, we have a theory, political philosophy has a theory about how we ensure that when humans are governing humans, it's in the interests of the governed. Um, but we have no comparable story about how we ensure that when we are governing animals, we're governing in the interests of animals. Um, we, we, we don't even pretend to ensure that the way in which we govern animals is responsive to the interests of the animals themselves. Right? Yeah, now this takes us quite nicely, I think, into the, the theme of what today's uh, episode is about, is, is rights, yeah. or, or animal rights. What does... Um, I think in, in you wrote you and, and Sue together wrote a, a fantastic book, Zoopolis, um, and you've written a fair number of articles. I saw over two hundred articles will blow my mind. Um, not all about animals, but also about multiculturalism. So you're fairly you you know a great deal about rights, yet you spend a significant portion of the beginning of your book speaking about animal rights and then speaking about some of its failings or some of the, the some of the I don't know if failings is the right word, but some of its shortfalls, perhaps. Um, could you maybe give me a sense of what, what, what is animal rights? When I say animal rights, does that just mean that, oh, I need to make sure that a cage is slightly bigger for the chicken? Or um, 
it's it's it seems like two basic words, animal and rights, but I think it's far more complicated. So what what does animal rights mean? Right. So in popular terminology, in popular debate, I think the term animal rights is used in a very, very broad way to refer to any proposal or reform that would improve the the uh, treatment of animals. And so increasing cage size in public debate is often described as an animal rights reform. So, um, but as a political philosopher, uh, I think that's an unhelpfully broad use of the term rights and that, uh, in fact, that whole idea that we could legitimately keep a chicken for its entire life inside uh, a wire cage is only possible because we actually don't think that the animal has rights. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, I, in our own work, we um, think about rights in a narrower way, which is that, um, which is connected to the idea of inviolability. So there are certain, the idea of co the concept of rights is intended to capture the idea that there are certain things we simply must not do to others. Um, uh, so if you think about it in a human case, when you talk about human rights, and we say, for example, that torture is a violation of human rights, what we mean is that it's intrinsically wrong to treat a human that way. And, and that's true even if we thought that torturing someone might generate some useful result. Um, and the same is true about uh, experimenting on people. So, you know, after World War II, uh, the international community decided that it was a violation of human rights to engage in the, in to use human beings as medical subjects mm -hmm. for experimentation, the way the Nazis done, but the way uh, many countries had done. Um, so, in in many of those cases, the people engaged when they were using humans as as exper just experimenting on humans, they thought they would get some useful knowledge from mm -hmm. it. But to say that there's a human right not to be experimented on is to say it doesn't, even if there would be some beneficial consequences, it's still an inherent violation of the way in which we should treat each other to experiment on people or to torture them or to subject to them to uh, um, you know, solitary confinement or, or, or violation of physical integrity, various kinds of, you know, uh, okay. So, those so are negative rights. Right? So those are in, so in the first instance, those are negative rights, okay. and they they are intended to um, express the idea that other individuals. So, I, and I believe this is true about animals as well as humans, um, are not simply resources for us to use in order to achieve some collective outcome that we desire. They are owed some intrinsic respect, and that respect that they're owed sets limits on how we can treat them. So the idea of rights is intended to, to draw those limits on how we can treat others. Um, so that's, that's the core idea of rights, and that's what um, we can call those intrinsic rights. And, we can have, and I, as I say, I think humans have intrinsic human rights, and I think animals have intrinsic animal rights. Um, these are primarily negative. And that's what, that's one level, if you like, of rights. And it's in many ways the most important for both humans and animals, is to have their intrinsic basic rights respected. But there's a second category of rights, which um, think about, which we call, which soon I call membership rights. And again, think about this in the, in the human case. So, um, every human being 
has their intrinsic human rights. But here in Canada, there is a second level of rights which are uh, owed to Canadian citizens mm -hmm. and which are not owed to all human beings simply because they're human beings. They are, they're tied to one's membership in Canada. So the right to vote, for example, is a membership right. So to, when tourists come to Canada, they don't have the right to vote. They have, they have their intrinsic human rights. So if you think about a tourist who comes to Canada, we cannot experiment on, the, on them. We, we can't uh, torture them, can't throw them in solitary confinement. Uh, but, but they don't have a human right to vote in Canada just because they're, they're, they're visiting for, for, mm -hmm. for a month. So the right to vote is a membership right, not a human right. And I think that's true generally about the welfare state in Canada. Tourists don't... If some, a tourist needs a hip replacement, they don't have a right to to have a hip replacement here in Canada. Um, so in the national health care. In the national... Exactly. They want to go yeah. to the public health care. Yeah. So, so we have... Um, so Canadians have membership rights. They have rights that, are, are, that we owe to each other as members of a shared political community citizenship rights, if you like, rights that are tied to our citizenship status rather than the mere fact that we're human beings. And uh, I think that these membership rights, um, if you think about what makes... I think that they are as important... If you think about, about our lives as human beings... And to think about the kind of whether people are able to lead decent lives in our societies, it's it's often as much about the quality of their membership rights mm -hmm. as their. So it's not protecting these fundamental intrinsic rights is really really important. But but if if that's all you have, if you don't have membership rights. If everywhere you moved around the face of the earth, all you had were your intrinsic human rights, and there was no place on earth that recognized you as a member with membership rights, it, you'd have a very difficult time. So, so an example of a membership right for, for a human would be the right to vote. The right so. to vote, but also the right to, 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 to kind of full access to the welfare state, um, mm -hmm. which I mean, includes things like higher education, job training. Um, paternity uh, leave, maternity yeah, leave. Yeah, so... so um, a range of, of social rights. Uh, does, does membership only extend as far as the state, or when you speak about membership, you're also speaking about membership at the organizational level? Uh, those well, would be rights, right? Sorry? Would those be rights, what you can uh, So, I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't... I, I'm not... Um, they could be... Org organizational rights could be could be described as rights. I, I, I'm, I'm, so, I'm... As a political philosopher, I'm really... I, I obsess about what the state does. Okay. Um, in part be because the state claims the right to govern us, mm -hmm. uh, which and I think that's a very specific sort of relationship and, and uh, needs to be held accountable. Whenever someone claims the right to govern us, we can demand some justification. Um, and so, uh, so as human beings, we have created a political order that, that recognizes these two levels of rights – Intrinsic human rights and membership rights, and I think we need. I think people need both. So, um, in the animal case, uh, I, so I think one of the things we need to think about in the animal case is: do animals also need two levels of rights? And so, the the traditional focus of animal rights theory has been on the first level trying to establish these very basic intrinsic rights of sentient animals not to be killed not to be subject to experimentation um, uh, these basic fundamental negative rights so that's what the animal rights movement has, has t tried to establish that there should be these basic limits on our that we don't have the right to harm animals, and so we try to establish these limits on the harmful treatment of animals. Mm -hmm. um, but as I said, in the human case, that w we wouldn't think that's sufficient. Um, it's, it, so, uh, so Sue and I and Zoopolis are are interested in the question of whether there aren't at least some circumstances where 
animals can also claim membership rights uh, in in a in a sh in the society that they share with us. So that we should think about society not as a human only uh, phenomenon, but as an interspecies society is an interspecies society, and it has human members and animal members, and that and that the animal members of these shared societies should also have access to these. Uh, membership rights. So how do you square something along the way? Uh, I mean, this obviously brings up some, I think, historical examples of the relationship between humans and humans, right? Where, yeah. where there are potentially membership rights that aren't afforded to all humans and yeah. aren't afforded to all humans equally. Um, I mean, slavery is, is, is a classic example. But then what also comes to mind, uh, and I think slavery, again, mm. provides a useful ways of having this conversation is that the rule to govern and animals are currently governed by ideas of property. Yeah. So how can you be a member and right. property? Is there right. a way to square these two? Right. So so in my view, absolutely not. So the first the first step towards um, recognition of rights at either level, either intrinsic negative rights or membership rights is to get animals out of the property box. So since Roman times, animals have been defined as property. It's not true about every society and every culture around the world, but in the West, since since uh, the ancient Romans, uh, animals have been defined as property. And I, th I think that that categorization of animals as property effectively makes it impossible to recognize them as the bearers of either intrinsic rights or membership rights. So, uh, in so ultimately, I don't think there's any way. Uh, I mean, I, I think that's that's uh, yeah. We just absolutely need to get animals out of the. Out, we need to change that categorization of them as property. I, I should note that there are some people, Alistair Cochran is one, who have argued that property that we don't that we can get recognition of animal rights without changing their property status including membership rights because he he endorses the idea that animals should be recognized as members of society with membership rights um, we don't he thinks we don't have to abolish their property status because he thinks that property in the law is essentially whatever society says it is, that there is no kind of necessary and sufficient content to the idea of property, and that it would be perfectly conceptually possible for a society to say that animals are both property and yet also uh, rights holders, um, and, or, and, and similarly that society could say that I own my dog, so that's an ownership relationship, and yet also say that that what ownership entails is that I have all sorts of responsibilities and no real rights over so so that you can define property in such a way that it's more about assigning responsibilities than assigning rights to property because you, you can't destroy someone else's property for example right I that's can't, so that's I can't burn down your right house or... right and 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 there are some forms of property which do come with Kind of, if you like, custodial responsibility. So there, if, if I own certain kind of like heritage properties or certain kinds of works of art, I I, I don't have the right to. It's not just that other people don't have a right to destroy property. Mm -hmm. I don't have the right to destroy my property because it comes with certain uh, guardianship responsibilities or custodial responsibilities. So so there is a. I, I mean, I think so. You know, Alistair's a a philosopher, and, and so he's interested in what's logically possible, and I think it is logically possible. We could imagine a universe in which a society, I mean, it's hard for me to imagine, but I, the, I think it is conceptually possible that you could that you could have a legal system that recognizes animals as rights holders while still defining them as property. I think that's logically possible. But I do not think in our world, with our history, that there's any way to square that circle um, just as in the human case, there'd be no way to say that we'd be able to create, you know, 
equal citizenship amongst whites and blacks and still have whites owning blacks. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just not, I mean... The power dynamics involved. Yeah. And, and having control over your decision-making or agency. Um. And and I, I think that that not, whatever whatever Alistair says about the logic, logical concepts involved, I think that pro we, we developed ideas of property it, primarily to express use relationships. We, we, we developed a category of property because people wanted to be able to control the things that they use and they benefit from. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that property is sociologically, historically and sociologically, an instrumental relationship. He, he thinks you can have kind of a non-instrumentalized conception of property, but I, I just, again, logically maybe, but historically I don't think so. So if property's got too much baggage as a, as a concept and as a, as a legal idea, I guess, to bring any sort of meaningful rights to animals, what then is the... Alternative. What, what's the alternative? Yeah. What, what, are, we, what, what are animals? <laughs> yeah. So uh, in, the, in the law at the moment, the only... Or who are animals? Huh. Yeah. Um, so this is this is this is really, the, I think, the central question in in animal law, uh, is what what's the right status, what's the right kind of legal status or legal subjectivity, if you like, for animals. And um, so, almost everyone who who cares about animals and who works on animal rights think that property is not working mm -hmm. and and can't really be fixed. And so we need some alternative. And in the, again, going back to the <coughs> Roman tradition, the alternative to property is personhood. So according to the, the Romans, there are, there are two things in the world. There's property no. and there's persons. Me yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, Persons have legal standing and legal rights. Um, they, they're recognized as subjects of the law. The, the per, persons have subjectivity, and as subjectivity, they have standing in the law, and they have and they're eligible to possess rights. Uh, whereas anything that's property does not have legal standing and does not have is not the bearer of rights. That's that's the Roman tradition, uh, which we still. We still, uh, as it were, live under. So, many people argue that there that the only alternative to property is personhood. So mm -hmm. that we should we should be fighting for the recognition of animals as persons, and that's uh, and and we have project we have legal campaigns to do precisely that. Um, in, the, the, the main ones that people may have heard about are the Great, Great Ape Project um, and the Non-Human Rights Project. And they, they both are engaged in um, either political advocacy or legal litigation um, to recognize sp specific, an specific animals as persons. So both the Great Apes Project and the Non-Human Rights Project has made the strategic decision that rather than fighting to get all animals or, or all sentient animals recognized as persons, that the right strategy is to pick a much smaller class, great apes, mm -hmm. or with the Non-Human Rights Project, they're also looking at elephants and perhaps cetaceans, whales, uh, and saying that they should be recognized as persons in part because they are... Um, seen as the more advanced or higher animals and that it's much more difficult you can't see will was using quotation okay marks. right yes <laughs> <I'm not>. uh, <laughs> uh, yeah thanks <laughs> and the 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 idea is that if we f if we focus on those animals we can see more clearly how arbitrary it is to treat humans as persons but great apes their evolutionary ancestor as as property like that that, that on, on so many criteria humans and great apes are so similar and we and and the, the you know they they evolved together and that they 
very similar nervous systems, very similar social lives, very similar emotional lives. The idea that one should be accorded personhood and the other treated as property just seems quite arbitrary. Haven't and, we already proven that the, the arbitrariness of this, I think just with human-to-human relations, like we were speaking earlier, I mean, doesn't that already show the arbitrary nature of the idea of humanity or, or human, um, at least in a social sense? So... Um, there's a, so this is, um, this is actually, a, this is really in some ways what the big debate is about. Um, because, so we know that the way in which the idea of the human, uh, Quotation marks. In quotation marks, <laughs> has been used historically that that societies has, have historically have treated some human beings as sub- subhuman, as deficient in humanity. So, uh, different racial groups, religious groups, ethnic groups, but also, um, uh, you know, m- men and women or able-bodied people with disabilities. We we've we've, we've created hierarchies of people who are seen as fully human and deficient in human. And it, and what, one way to look at that history is to say, well, this just shows that our, our ideas about what it is to be human are kind of arbitrary, they're socially constructed, um, so, they, so we shouldn't put much... They, they can't really bear the moral weight that, that, that they're, they're... Yeah, they're kind of arbitrary... But other people look at that history and say, okay, the only, the only way to avoid those sorts of hierarchies amongst humans is to draw a very sharp boundary between humans and the rest of the animals. So some people look at... So we're both looking at the same history, but drawing opposite conclusions. So... One way, one way to look at that history is to say, look, these ideas of who's human and who's not human, they're arbitrary. We, we should instead just acknowledge that, that, that there are continuities, mm-hmm. um, that we're all vulnerable embodied beings, and that's what the law should protect. That, I, that's my view, and that's, what I think, the view of many people in the animal rights community. But the, the humanists, if we can call them that, they look at the same history, and they go, okay, it's clear we have this tendency to draw distinctions amongst humans about who's more human and who's less human. We need to stop that. The way to stop that is to render sacred the category of Homo sapiens. So we're going to draw, we're going to make species membership the basis of human rights, of personhood, of, of sanctity. That we're going to, we're going to, we're going to make, we're going to sanctify the human. And say that that humans are radically distinct from from animals. So it's another form of biological reductionism, then. Yeah, but it's it's in part. I mean, I I think that many of the people who engage in this move, they actually know perfectly well that the biological facts do not support. They, they know that if you just looked at this scientifically, and asked, you know, what what really what are the real differences between human beings and non-human animals, that, that the answers are going to be, you know, complicated and murky, and it's going to be more co- continuities and discontinuities. So they, But their view is, we need to politically commit ourselves to creating a radical distinction between humans and non-human animals. That the only way... So basically, their, their remedy for the historic problem that, about the fact that some human beings have dehumanized others is to sanctify the human. Is that not a born of, I think, that in those practices of dehumanizing humans, it's a, <laughs> it's a strange sentence to say, but, um, you know, in, in making, in those who had power, making those who did not have power feel less than human, uh, kind of, I mean, the hierarchy you're speaking about, it glorifies the idea of human and puts it at the apex of a hierarchy, but that in those practices and processes, in those relationships, I think animal tropes were constantly yep. used, used to yep. achieve that. Yep. So I think in reifying, 
I mean, I, I'm very much with you in um, the destabilizing, I think, of the categories rather than the, the, you know, the cementing of them. But the fact that animal tropes were used throughout right. these processes, yeah. I think, might be um, part of the reason yep. why there, there's this need to call. But then coming, coming back to speaking about rights, what do these kinds of um, discursive moves, these quite like rigid ideas about human, animal, um, mean materially, I think, in terms of rights? Like, how, what, what rights do animals actually possess? Are there any, um, you know, legally speaking, do animals have any rights uh, as it currently stands now? Well, so not in Canada. Um, None at all? No, no, no. There's no, no, no animal rights in Canada. So, we, the, so again, it probably depends on what you, what, what, what we mean by rights. So again, in this, in this very broad public, in the sense that it's used in the public, um, certain kinds of animal welfare regulations um, would count as an animal rights measure. Mm-hmm. But there are, in fact. No, um, I mean, I, I would say we're missing animal rights in in, in two. In t- in two, di- there are two different ways of of showing that we don't have animal rights. One is that there are no uh, principled limits on the extent to which animals can be harmed for human benefit. So um, there is no form of of harming or killing animals that is prohibited um, even, you know, so if, if humans think they have some legitimate interest or benefit from harming or killing animals, there is no, the, the law does not say, you know, you must never do X to an animal um, uh, because because that would be a violation of, of the animal's uh, integrity. integrity or whatever. Um, and so... You know that can. I mean, obviously, there's no, there's, there's uh, any any form of animal experimentation. There's no, there's no, there are no forms of animal experimentation that are prohibited uh, on, on animals. There's, there's no form of confinement that's that's uh, kind of inherently prohibited. No, 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 no animal has a right to. Basically, no animal has a right to life in Canada. There's no, there's no animal that we could point to and say that animal has a right not to be killed. There is no such animal. So I have no inherent right to say my yeah. life is my yeah. Life. So and, you, you, and so let me just finish. So that's that's one. Is that, so there's, there, there's no animal rights in the sense that there's no in principle limit on what a human could do to an animal. A related way of showing that there's no animal rights is that animals have no standing in court. So that's to say, if anything, so there there are so there are for example cruelty laws, and so if if someone was charged with, um, or someone, if someone engaged in an action that we reasonably thought was a violation of uh, the cruelty provisions, the, 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 obviously the, the animal cannot sue the, the perpetrator. The, the animal cannot demand that the, that, that be prosecuted. There, there's, um, th- I mean, this is actually a, a problem that even when we know that there are humans who are violating existing laws. There is no way, because animals don't have stand, because they're property, they don't have standing in, in the law, therefore they have no way of insisting that the law be enforced. So there, there, there are actually cases about this. In Quebec recently, um, some animal rights advocates tried to sue the provincial government for not enforcing the laws, but the, it it didn't work because the the um, in these kinds of cases, the only people who are allowed to bring suit are those who are affected by the state's failure, and the animal rights advocates they're just third parties, mm-hmm. right? So they're saying, well, it's the animals that are affected, but the animals don't have legal standing. So there's, there, it's actually just this, there's this, I mean, there, there, some jurisdictions have tried to change this, but in Canada we haven't, that there, there is, because animals are not, have to have no legal subjectivity, you could have a law, but there is no way for the animals 
to in, to actually insist that the law be enforced. And so, so as as in Quebec, but it's in, it's true in other provinces. Even if there's demonstrable evidence that the laws are being violated, um, there's no there's no mechanism because because animals don't have standing. Um, is yeah. But people who are who are listening might think, okay, so we've got an animal who has standing. Let's imagine a, a universe yeah. in which an animal does. How would they do that? How would they bring a court case forward? Yeah, so, so you know, if you think about this in comparable human cases, so if you think about children uh, or people with cognitive disabilities, we, we, they're persons and they have rights. They're not able themselves to go to court. Mm-hmm. They may not have the cognitive capacities to, to understand what it would mean, but we appoint um, guardians or trustees uh, uh, to to act in the interests of the the, the individual that they are a guardian for, uh, and the courts that and and we do that precisely to make sure that their legal subjectivity, their personhood, can be effectively pursued uh, in in the courts. Um, it's, so it's it's it's, a, it's like it's a fundamental right. Uh, one of our fundamental rights is that we have uh, the, that if we are not able to to um, make legal claims on our own behalf, that the court appoints someone whose job it would be to represent us in court. That wasn't there? Was it in? Oh, I'm going to get it wrong, but I think it was in Switzerland where they've now got someone who's like the appointed. No. Yes and no. Advocate. Advocate. Uh, yeah. yeah yeah, I mean to bring forward like legal cases. And yeah, but so, so that's a yes and no. So they have they 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 had um, an office of an animal advocate, um, but it it was uh, it, and and it was intended to bring uh, cases only for the enforcement of existing laws. So so then everything depends on how good the laws are that mm-hmm. are being enforced. And if the laws basically say that humans can harm animals whenever they whenever they have an interest in doing so, which is essentially what our our laws say, then then all the animal advocate can do is really go after cases of just um sadistic mistreatment. Yeah. So one of the things you propose, which I think is um, in your claim to fame, yours and Sue's, in, in the book, um, is the idea of citizenship rights. And I think to, to just come full circle, so we've spoken now about negative rights, um, that, that no one no one should be harmed, and, and you believe that that should be extended to, to animals as well. Uh, and then you spoke about membership rights. Um, but in your book, you spend quite a bit of time speaking about the idea of animals as citizens. Could you just briefly maybe tell us how how these are all connected to one another and what it's got to do with uh, animal rights? So, so if you think so, we have these two levels of the kind of basic intrinsic rights and the membership rights, and one way to think about it is. So the basic rights prohibit certain kinds of mistreatment, but they don't tell us anything yet about how we should relate to animals, um, just as they don't really tell us anything about how we should relate to humans. Um, they, 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 they tell us a bunch of things we must not do, thou shalt not do X or Y, but they don't tell us anything about how we should relate, what kinds of relationships we should build. Um, and some people, they look at the history of human-animal relationships and they conclude, not unreasonably, that humans are prone to instrumentalizing animals and to oppressing animals and exploiting them, instrumentalizing them, And so so they're deeply skeptical about the idea that there can be just 
relationships between humans and animals. And the conclusion they draw is that, uh, yeah, the, whenever humans and animals become entangled, you could just get oppression, instrumentalization, and so we need to disentangle humans and animals. Mm -hmm. And we disentangle them either by kind of physical segregation, so that humans live here, animals live there, um, which, uh, so you have kind of areas of human urban uh, settlement and then areas of wild animal habitat, but you try to keep them as far as apart as possible. And, and in that world... Um, yeah, we, we respect animals' basic rights by having nothing to do with them. So we respect the rights of these wild animals living on their own territory, but we have no relationship with them. Um, and that, that model just doesn't work for domesticated animals. I, I think that can work for some, for some wild animals, and I think it should, and we should largely, in, for, many, for, for many types of wild animals, I think we should basically just leave them alone. And, and we best respect their rights by just having nothing to do with them and uh, staying, staying away from them and vice versa. But with respect to domesticated animals, that's just not a viable picture. And so uh, we, well, our, our lives are entangled with domesticated animals. They, mm -hmm. They've been bred to be dependent on us. Um, and so I think if we, if we want to think about just relationships with domesticated animals, it can't be on this model of let's sever relationships or let's uh, uh, what what uh, Akampora calls uh, species apartheid. This this idea that we we try to keep animals and humans as far apart as possible. Uh, in the case of, dom of domesticated animals, we need to think about what it means to live together in proximity, uh, indeed in kind of intimate proximity, um, as members of a shared society. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, that that then then we need to think not just about respecting their negative rights. We need to think about what would what kinds of rights would be required for a society uh, to be for for these intimate these close proximate intimate relationships between humans and domesticated animals to be fair to be just. How can we, how can we make sure that the the norms, the rules, the institutions that govern this shared society of humans and, and domesticated animals living in close proximity? How can we make sure that those rules and institutions, and so on, are responsive to the interests of animals as much as they are to the interests of humans? Mm -hmm. So this goes back to the very beginning about how do we ensure that that the governing is legitimate and not tyranny. So I think at the moment what we've got is a situation in which the governing of animals is essentially tyranny um, because there's no mechanism to ensure that the governing of this shared society is responsive to the interests of animals. And that would be true even if, we, even if tomorrow we respected their basic rights and we no longer slaughtered them or experimented on them. It would still be the case that there's no mechanism to ensure that the rules governing this shared society are responsive to the interests of animals. So you think? So you've mentioned things such as like medical care for for animals as, as something a society being responsive to right. an animals' interests, um, or or potentially uh, even in reading your work, I was thinking about like education. You know, we think about children and what what responsibility and services, I guess, right. does the government have to you to help you uh, meet your your needs and. I think quite interestingly is um, also some ideas about mobility. Yeah. Um, you know, in whose interest is it to have dogs on leashes all the time or uh, to limit the mobility of, of animals? And even in listening to you speak now, um, you speak now about animals in close proximity, but of course there are domesticated animals that we're not in close proximity to. Uh, you know, we've had... The oldest, I think, domesticated relationship is with dogs, if I'm not mistaken. It's 15,000 years. And then the second oldest is with cows, so 12,500 years. But in most urban, or many urban settlements, primarily ones in the, in the north, um, you're not going to find them in close proximity, but they're still deserving, I think, yep. of some of these. So I... Um, so we have, at, at some point... 
um, in the Western tradition, uh, in Western societies, the category of, of domesticated animals became subdivided into companion animals and farmed animals. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think those categories actually... I mean, those are historical. Those, that, that's, that, that sharp split, that, in a today's society, that is a very sharp split. Um, so the companion animals, we would never think about eating, um, and we, we think of that as a, as a, as a, a relationship of companionship and, and, and as family members. So the, the statistics are, I mean, amazing. Like 93% of people who have dogs or cats think of them as members of the family. So, so um, whereas farmed animals have been reduced to this extraordinarily abject status of just, just being resources, um, and we don't want to see them, and so we force them out of the city and put them into these invisible uh, uh, factory farms and so on, uh, and, and, try, and try not to think about them. And, and now there's, you know, when, when there's thousands of them in a, in a factory farm, no one, no one pretends that they get to know them, they, they wouldn't have names. And, mm -hmm. But if you, if you think back even not that long ago, uh, the uh, families uh, would have had, uh, you know, they might have had a cow and a pig and a dog, and, and they, 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 they were, um, uh, there wasn't this kind of rigid separate, and they all lived in the, in the, in the family household, and, and, um, um, and they all would have been known, to, and they often all would have been named. And so, um, so I, I, I think we need to dissolve. So we've got, so we have, in my view, a kind of double challenge. One is to, to, is to reduce, is to challenge the hierarchy of humans over animals. But we have a second challenge within the category of animals, and particularly within the category of domesticated animals, we need to challenge the hierarchy between companion animals and farmed animals. Mm -hmm. um, and I think all, I mean, a lot of the strategies that apply in the first case also apply in the second. So if you look at the at the the ethological evidence, we know that pigs are just as smart as dogs. That all, all the stuff that you know about animals and humans, the continuities and social life, emotional life. The, the, this this distinction between companion animals and farmed animals is t is totally arbitrary, yeah. um, and has no relationship to to sentience, to needs, to interests, to capacities. So um, I, I don't think that. Um, so in our in our image of a utopia, the the there there would be no there would be no distinction between companion animals and farmed animals. They, they are they are domesticated animals, uh, which means that they are capable of um, uh, interspecies social relationships. They couldn't have been domesticated unless they were capable of having certain kinds of social relationships with us of trust and communication and cooperation and so on, and. We have a duty with respect to both to find what kinds of social relationships they want to have with us. Yeah. And I, 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 so I, that's as important in relation to cows and pigs and chickens as it is with dogs and cats. And, um, and so, and I would expect that that would involve, I mean, th there are all sorts of complications, but, um, uh, you know, that that would involve rethinking this this assumption that we've grown up with that kind of dogs belong in in the in the city but cows don't. I I mean we we might well end up creating various forms of uh, res, or restoring uh, urban commons, urban parks in such a way that we would we would start to see pigs in cities the way which was absolutely common in in earlier periods. Two hundred years ago. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really just interesting to think about some of the ideas you're speaking, because you speak about riots as being intimately involved with um, the state in, in many regards, but the relationships uh, with, with animals, our multi-species communities have extended far beyond, you know, the nation state. We were, we were in these communities, uh, these relationships yeah. for, for, you know, have been for thousands, thousands of years, which I think both dogs and cows and and cats, um, they, they start to illustrate how long those relationships yeah. have gone. And I think are they for deserving of the kind of consideration you give them. 
Um, I've got two more questions because I, I fear that you and I could, uh, well, I could just listen to you for, for hours. <laughs> um, so I've got two questions. Uh, as you know, I'm a PhD student and I'm entering the realm of, of animal studies. This is, for me, the, the kind of beginning of a journey. Uh, and in thinking about early career um, academics or people that are maybe beginning to think about animals or animals in the law, uh, what are some key areas or advice or tips, like I guess I'm just leaving it kind of open-ended, that you would give to people that are starting to ask these types of questions about the relationship between animals and, and rights or law? Well, so I, I do think um, it's it's important and, and useful to understand something about the structure of um, I mean the basic building blocks of animal law which is because I, I mean I, I confess I, I did not understand how truly awful uh, animal law is I, I, I think we all grow up with the idea that there is some sort of effective protection of animals that we have something called animal protection laws. We we all grow up with that idea that we have that the law <laughs> protects animals, mm -hmm. right? And that we have something called animal protection laws. It's it's just totally not true, <laughs> um, and it's important to figure out why it's not true. Um, so uh, the an, animal law does not exist to protect animals. I mean, this is this uh, th th we've just got to. I mean, it's really it's really important to get over that fundamental mis understanding that I certainly had. The animal law exists to authorize humans to harm animals. That, that, that is the purpose of animal law, is to ensure that people are legally protected in harming animals. It's, the animal law is essentially about distributing authorizations to harm animals. It's animal use. We have animal use law. That's what we have. Mm -hmm. We have laws authorizing people to use and harm animals. Um, and uh, so the, 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 it's just the, 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 the premise of animal law is that humans have the right to use animals for our benefit. That is the starting point. The, the starting point of animal law is not that animals are intrinsically worthy of respect and therefore should be protected. The starting point of animal law is humans have the right to use animals. And law... Uh, entrenches, affirms, entrenches, and protects that fundamental claim that humans have the right to use animals. That is, that's the base of animal law. Um, and then, th what we call, what we think of as animal protection law, um, is essentially this prohibition on cruelty, which is, uh, which is not, it's not that the law identifies a particular form of inflicting pain as being cruel. It's not that the law recognizes certain interests of the animal that must always be respected and against which cruelty is undefined. Cruelty is defined as the unnecessary infliction uh, of pain on animals beyond what's necessary for achieving the use that we assert that we have the right to use them for, right? So animal law says humans have the right to use animals, Basically, for whatever purpose we want, that, that that that, and they can be, and the law says it's very explicit in the Canadian cases, but in others, that these can be quite trivial interests. Like it, it can be just the t the fact that we like the taste of their flesh, or that we like the feel of their fur. They they, they don't have to be important or profound human interests. Uh, we can harm animals for whatever interest we want. All the law says is, you can't inflict more pain than is necessary to achieve that use. So even if our reason for inflicting pain is essentially trivial, like we just like the feel of something, or we like watching something, that's okay, but we can't gratuitously, we can't uh, impose more gratuitous, basically sadistic uh, pain beyond what was needed to achieve the use. The use itself doesn't have to be necessary. It's not like we need to eat meat or we need to wear fur. The, the law is very clear on this. It's not that the, the test is not 
is this uh, harming uh, animals necessary for us in the sense that we need to do it in order to survive or to flourish? We can just do it because we because it's for our pleasure, because because as I say, we like the taste of flesh or we like the feel of fur. Um, but we just we should we should just take steps to ensure that there's no gratuitous infliction of pain in the process of using animals for our benefit. So that's I mean that's just so so. There is no interest that animals have that is inherently protected. We can we can we can sacrifice their most their most basic interests in order to advance our most trivial interests. The law is totally totally okay with our sacrificing the most basic interests of animals in order to advance our most trivial interests. Mm -hmm. We just can't be sadistic in, <laughs> when we do it. We can't impose a gratuitous. I mean, this this is. I mean, it's again. It it's I, to my mind, it's just a complete mis uh, a misrepresentation to describe that as animal protection law. That's that's animal use law. It's animal harm law. We're authorizing people to we're upholding the right of humans to use animals. And it's, so it's I think it's important to understand how weak and how basic, in my view, essentially meaningless uh, this cruelty, unnecessary suffering. People think that the you know when the law prohibits unnecessary suffering of animals. That that imposes some sort of substantive restriction on how humans treat animals, but it doesn't. That we can we can do as again we can sacrifice their most basic interests in pursuit of our most trivial interests. So you think a, a, an early career someone who, someone who's interested in this should at least grapple with and have a look at these to understand what the foundation of these are. So I I think that the, there's no way to understand human animal relations. So. Everything that humans, every feature of how humans and animals interact is governed by law. Mm -hmm. And the foundation of the legal regulation of human animal relations is that animals are property and we have the right to use them for our benefit. That's the baseline. So the, the law creates this structure in which every time a human and animal interact, the law has structured that relationship in a way that the human, that the animal is property, the human has the right to use the animal for their benefit. That's the law has every we 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 move around in a social world that has been structured by the law around these ideas of animals as property and human rights to use animals. So to fundamentally change these multi-species relationships, we need to change, change the law. I, I, so you can, you can, as an individual, you can try to um, distance yourself, as it were, from those legal presumptions. You can try to interact with your own dog or cat in a way you, you can, so the law says you own your dog. The dog is your property. You can decide you're not going to treat your your dog as a, as property. You can decide you're going to treat your dog as a member of the family. And then some people, for some people, that's just rhetoric. Others try to think through what that means. But so, as individuals, we can choose to interact with animals um, in a way that it um, departs from the legal presumptions. And so, we can do that as individuals. We could even try to do that. As collectivity, so if you think about farmed animal sanctuaries, they they are set up in order to create a space that's in fact challenging it, the whole purpose. And if you go to a farmed animal sanctuary and you, and you listen to the tour, um, the introduction that they, they will they will explicitly say, the law treats the pigs and the sheep and the chicken as property mm -hmm. to be used. We reject that. And so we're trying to create in this farmed animal sanctuary a legal space that treats animals differently from what the law says. That, that's it's very explicit strategy to, to try to contest, the, to try to get people to see animals as something other than what the law says they are. So to practice an alternative universe. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But even there, you know, um, there's only so much you can do it, when the when the law says one thing about who animals are namely that they're property that, that exists for us to use, you can try to create this space either in your own home or in, in a, something like a farmed animal sanctuary that, that operates on a different logic. But um, you're still... So these farmed animal sanctuaries, they are still governed 
by agricultural law, by property law, by zoning laws, by laws about re- f- food, about laws about vaccines, about public health. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, you hear these horrible stories that, about uh, sanctuaries that, that to try to create this alternative space, and then, you know, an, an illness shows up in a farm you know, uh, um, yeah. I mean, you can. Be, be, and then they have to put down yeah, the animals because of agricultural yeah, laws. Yeah. Oh no! So you can't, you can't escape. You, you can try to distance yourself from the law, from what the law says animals are. But you can't, you can't, you can't just opt out of the law. It's, it's still the law still governs. And human even though people practice, um, I think the law is the, the starting point at, at which, I, I, if I'm gathering, the law is the. Ground zero for, yeah. for starting to... Uh, I mean, practice definitely starts to make those laws seem like they should be changed. People yes. People that create and these ultimate... Uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's not a clear... The law comes and then practice comes. I think often practices start to shape what laws... Yes, and I, and I believe that the existing law is... Gr- every day is getting more and more out of sync with... Uh, public opinion. Mm-hmm. I, I, this idea of animals as property that we have a right to use, I mean, it, it's it's a very old idea, and it's quite deeply rooted in Western culture, so it's, it's, it, it's the, but it, it's, um, the law, the law is a kind of um, unreconstructed expression of that very old idea, and um, there are all sorts of domains in which the general public no longer believes that that's the right way to think about a relationship with at least some animals for some purposes in some contexts, and so the law is is out of out of touch with the way many people think about some of their relationships with animals, um, and uh, and it's it's a, it's a, it's creating interesting conflicts. I mean, this is particularly true about companion animals. So the fact that the law the law treats companion animals as property. Uh, here in Canada, and so just as an example, um, that means that in the case of a divorce, the determination of where a companion animal goes in case of, so who question so in it, it, so most many families have companion animals. Mm-hmm. So now there's a divorce. Who gets custody of the dog or the cat? So in the case of the child, if it's, if it's a human child, the answer is it's got to be in the best interest of the child. So we ask, who, does, who, would, the ch- who would the child be better off with? The mother, the father, uh, or sh- shared custody or whatever. We ask from the perspective of the child what's in the best interest of the child. That's mm-hmm. the legal standard, the best interest of the child. The dog or the cat is property, and therefore the rules are the same as govern the distribution of property. So for the purposes of custody decisions, the question is basically who bought the dog? Who, who has wow. the better property title? So it's like a couch. So who that, kept their receipt? Exactly. And, so, and there are cases I, um, in which judges say, I mean, um, that the, so the, the, and this is true even if the, 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 the couple, they want, Custody be to be decided on the basis of who's the, who's in, whose custody would be in the best interest. They love their dog or cat, and so they would prefer that the court make this decision based on the best interest of the animal. And they make arguments about why they it would be better for the dog to go with them. But then the judge will say, "I don't care what's in the interest of the of the dog. That's not my job. My job. This is a piece of property. I'm gonna." Out. And so the judges will say that the best interest of the dog has no more legal. Uh, standing than the best interest of a, of a motorcycle or a couch. Or that. This is what the judges actually say in the courtroom, um, and it's shocking to the to, to the to the couple because they, they've never thought of their. Because well, this is also a being with a personality. Exactly, and, and so history, yeah, and yeah, and so mm-hmm. we we have a growing number of cases in which people come to the courts with a with a view about how they relate to an animal as something other than property. And the and the courts are saying you've got to think of your animal as a piece of property. That's when you enter the courtroom. This is how we we think of the animal as property. You've got to start thinking this way. 
and and people don't like it. And so people are. Fi- I mean, I could, there's a whole slew of cases where this. It's also about about things like, um, you know, if if. So here's another c- case. Um, <laughs> we are going to be up yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll stop with this. About about. Uh, it's so interesting. Though. Um, uh, damages in the case of. Uh, so imagine that a neighbor runs over your dog. In a car, so so the, the the okay, and let's say it's uh, the so so your dog now needs medical care. So, mm-hmm. so let's say the leg was broken, uh, and so you sue for for damages. Um, so the standing, so from the point of view of the courts, the dog is a piece of property. So the question is, what's the value of the dog? And under property rules. That's a question of what's the replacement cost? What would it cost to replace that dog? And so let's imagine it's an eight-year-old mutt that you that you adopted from a shelter. What's the va- what's the replacement cost? Zero. You could go. You can get another dog from a shelter for for adoption, like for 50, a fifty-dollar fee, right? So though, so you could. It may cost like eight hundred dollars to get the dog medical care. The courts will say you don't have a claim to eight hundred dollars. Yeah, that's so out of sync with people's relationship exactly. and response to what so, those medical needs. Yeah, are. and so it's interesting that some American jurisdictions have changed these laws, both about custody of animals and about property, uh, about damages, um, tort tort law. Uh, Canada hasn't, so we're behind the U.S. on this as as on other. Yeah. Mm. So, but but the point is that this is we, again we've got this basic. It's really fundamental structure of animal law that animals are property, and that our relationship with them is basically we use them for our benefit. That's what the law structures are. And 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 uh, there are increasing number of contexts where people go to the courts and are shocked to find that that's what the law says. I mean, also what's interesting is how these relationships with the law are mitigated. I guess, by how closely the animals are related to humans, right? So uh, in the case of the dogs that you've spoken about here in terms of custody or, um, you know, damages, it's mitigated through their relationship with humans. Yet what kind of custody or damages are due to liminal animals, right? So uh, actually walking here to to get to the interview, I saw a squirrel that had been run over. And I found myself a bit paralyzed because there was a squirrel lying in the middle of the road and I wanted to to move it I feel like that the, it needed that respect at least to be moved but then I found myself um, you know somewhat crippled by the, the task of being moved like but then I knew that no one would take responsibility yeah. for, for this being like who owes damages whose interests are for the squirrel that it's been knocked by a car that there are no um, you know infrastructure necessarily in place for squirrels to cross yeah. roads yeah. I mean they're, they're very good with cable lines and stuff Um but I think it is just interesting, and this drives back to the beginning about what are animals' interests, what are their legal needs, and that these are not necessarily the same for all animals, yeah. um, particularly because of how they relate to society. Um, I'm going to ask my final my final question here, which um, is a bit of an odd one. I'm going to see how this works. Um, I'm going to do it for the first couple of, of interviews. Um, so I asked you to see if you could find a piece of literature, so a journal article or a book, um, and to see if there was a quote you wanted to read that you think people would find interesting. And then I'll share the title of uh, that in, in, the, in the credits for the podcast. So who did you say that on? Well, so I had... I had um, so I wasn't sure what, was, what would work. <laughs> It's hard. So, yeah. I was trying to think of an answer to the question uh, myself, and I was like, "Who would I pick? I have no idea." So I, I have, I have. I mean, so I, I uh, so uh, there. I do have a short quote from Leslie Bisgold, who I guess you will be interviewing later. Yeah. Um, from her Thank book. Thank you for the introduction. <laughs> uh, um, which is just, in a way, just summarizes what a lot of what we've been discussing about. The, in my view, is basically the, the the misnomer of animal protection law. Um, well, so I'll, I'll just—it's a very short quote. Okay. So she she she's uh, explaining. In her, so this is from her book *Animals and the Law*, which is really the the main um, textbook on animal law in Canada. Um, so she, she's explaining the anti-cruelty provisions 
um, of the Criminal Code in Canada. And she says, these laws protect the routine practices that are common in a given activity by drawing out for condemnation only singular acts of extraordinary behavior. If many people find it convenient, enjoyable, or profitable to do things that hurt animals, those things are not legally cruel. So long as causing animals to suffer is not the only object of the act, the fact that they suffer as a result becomes almost entirely irrelevant. So that's the end of the quote. So that I, it's just it's just a nice summary that it, that what we call what we consider what we call anti cruelty provisions um, are not are not about uh, avoiding suffering of animals that they don't in any way actually limit um, the, the, the actual the, the suffering of animals as she says is basically irrelevant in deciding whether something violates a cruelty provision the suffering of animals is essentially irrelevant mm-hmm. what matters is is what they did is what the human did to the animal something that many people find convenient enjoyable profitable and if they do then that's fine I that's like it. how she contrasts the idea of extraordinary that, that right. it's seen as extraordinary versus what is systematic right so, um, you know, the systematic abuse becomes invisible and only yeah. extraordinary cases are brought to light, which yeah. I think is um, really drives home a lot of what you've been saying here um, in this. And then I think we, we don't have too much, we don't have time to, to get into it now, but I, you and Sue are working on some pretty exciting stuff about trying to think of what the future of law and the future of these societies would uh, look like. Do you have any uh, upcoming stuff that people might look forward to, to seeing what some of your answers to that might be? Well, so... Um, some of your thoughts. Maybe so I, I have a... Uh, I actually, I mean, I published recently an article on a, a um, on animal law um, which tries to um, explore the interaction between um, membership rights and intrinsic mm-hmm. rights. So basically, as, as we discussed earlier, um, most people who care about animals in the field of animal law have been fighting for personhood as the main legal strategy. And... For a variety of reasons, but but as we but as we discussed, they've tended to focus on just some very high profile cases like great apes or mm-hmm. elephants or cetaceans. Um, but but basically, for many people, the 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 way they think about reforming animal law is how to get animals out of property into personhood. And I I just I think absolutely that is ultimately the long term goal. Um, but we're, we're a long way from that. And so I'm interested in the question of whether one step on the road towards recognition of these of personhood is through the recognition of membership rights. And what, what journal, what, what is so it's in the So it's in the Dalhousie Law Journal. And uh, I can send you the reference. But so, so basically, so, but I'm looking at things like the recognition in some jurisdictions, not in Canada, but in some jurisdictions of animals as family members, that some provisions of family law have been amended to, to basically recognize that for some legal purposes, animals should be seen as members of the family rather than property of the family. And there have also been some jurisdictions which have sort of Recognize that for some purposes, animals should be seen as workers, mm-hmm. um, not as the property of a, of a workplace. And those, I think, are implicit recognition of what I'm calling membership rights, even though they don't yet have personhood rights. And I actually think that's an interesting... So many people that I've talked to in animal law, they they think that the sequence has to be you first are recognized as a person, and then you'll be eligible for membership rights as well. But personhood has to come first. And uh, I, I actually think, I, I mean, I'm, I'm increasingly interested in the possibility that that might be the wrong sequence, and that it might be that there's room in the legal system and in the political system, because these legal changes require political coalitions and so on, 
that there might be scope for recognition of some of these membership rights prior and as a step towards, and that it'll be easier to get recognition of animals as persons if we've already recognized them for some purposes as members of society. Mm. Um, I, I mean, I, so that's that's partly a, you know, it's, it's in part just a question of strategy, um, the, whether, whether there's more room for success uh, for effective advocacy in relation to membership rights, given that I think the route to personhood rights is blocked for the foreseeable future, at least in Canada. Well, it sounds very exciting, yeah. and I think, um, thank you for all of the work you've done, <laughs> yeah. and uh, for thinking through these complicated problems, and I look forward to, so you've raised some important things here about personhood and, um, and you know, subjectivity, so hopefully through season one, focusing on law, we're going to get to some of these, but for now, I just want to say thank you so much for giving me so much of your time, and um, fingers crossed everything goes well. <laughs> Good, thank you. Thank you. big thank you to Gordon Clark for doing the bed music, Jeremy John for the logo, and a huge thank you to Animals in Philosophy, Politics, Law, and Ethics, Apple, for sponsoring this podcast. This is The Animal Turn with me, Claudia Hertzenfelder. Thank you for listening to this podcast produced at CFRC 101.9 FM in Kingston, Ontario at Queen's University, situated on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. The CFRC Podcast Network at podcast.cfrc.ca is brought to you by the generous support of the Queen's University Faculty of Engineering and Applied Sciences.